Welcome to episode three of the Ultimate Grinder Showdown. Today we're looking at the Malkernig EK43S. And I think it's safe to say that this is probably the most influential piece of coffee equipment in the last 10 years. First, some history of this company and this grinder. So Malkernig as a company goes back to 1924. They weren't called Malkernig then, but they made uh, motors for grinders or mixers or food processing, that kind of stuff. They began to concentrate on coffee grinders in the 1960s and trade more heavily under the Malkernig brand. They actually formally became Malkernig in 2005, but they're now part of the Hemro group. Now at the end of the 1970s, they began to produce this model. Now the name, EK43, is not a beautiful name, but it does make some sense. The E stands for Einphasenstrom, which is the German for single phase. When it comes to motors and things like grinders, whether it is single phase or three phase is really quite important. And you'll still see DK grinders from Malkonig, which is Dreifasenstrom, uh, made today. So E for Einphasenstrom, K for Kaffee the German spelling of coffee. 43 is the motor designation. There was a 23. They presume there was a 33, but no one seems to know anything about it. The S in this particular model is because this is a shorter version of that grinder. There were several different versions of this grinder made for different things. There was one for pepper, one for linseed, one for poppy seed, one for grains generally, and they had different letters after the E. So the EP was for pepper in that particular case. It was a generally successful product from its initial sort of beginnings. It had its fans, it had people who didn't really care about it. It did do a pretty cool version called the EKK, which was sort of two hoppers, two grinders in one, and that was kind of fun. But it wasn't really until around 2009, 2010, that it had a dramatic change in its trajectory and came into the spotlight. So in 2009, 2010, a guy called Scott Rayo is experimenting with his one in a cafe he was involved in at the time called Cafe Myriad in Montreal. And he noticed when brewing with his Fetco that he was able to push his extractions much higher than he had expected to taste good. 23, 24% of the coffee being extracted back then was a surprisingly high number. Uh, and that became part of the kind of workflow in that cafe. It was an influential cafe, and a few different people came by and learnt about this particular thing. Uh, one being a guy called Ben Kaminsky, who was the person who told me about this whole thing, and another, a guy called Matt Perger. Now, Matt would hugely popularise this grinder by using it as part of his World Brewster Championship routine and talking about brewing espresso with this to, to achieve very high extraction yields. No one had really been doing that. and. You know, those of us had found out about this, we were starting to experiment and try to understand why was this doing this? You know, why, what was special about this grinder? In truth, Malkonig themselves had no idea this grinder was special. In fact, it was slated to be discontinued in 2013, though the boom in its popularity obviously prevented that from happening. It drove the conversation about more unimodal grinding, more evenness in grinding and how that can impact extraction, how we can have higher extractions, potentially better tasting coffee as a result, uh, and this thing just boomed in popularity. Malkonig could not make enough of these things and today it still struggled to keep up with demand. They're a staple in just about every specialty coffee shop around the world. They, they, they are still incredibly popular. Now, despite all of this, despite its influence, despite how clearly excellent it is at what it does, reviewing it here does feel a little bit unfair. Of these five grinders, this is different from the others because it's built first and foremost for a commercial environment. That has a number of different impacts, but we'll start with an obvious one, which is the price. This thing typically costs around $3,000, but prices will fluctuate because the distribution of this grinder is different to all the other grinders I'm reviewing. With the other grinders, I bought them direct from manufacturer, shipped from wherever they were in the world to me here. With this, with commercial equipment, distribution works differently. Malkonig would have built this grinder and sold it to a national distributor. And that national distributor probably didn't sell it to an end user or to a cafe, it probably went through a dealer. And so typically with this kind of model, you end up with the person who sells it to the cafe or the end user being able to offer them more support because they're local to them or something like that. But this kind of distribution model means that there are several businesses between manufacturer and user making some money. And so while this might be a $3,000 grinder, that certainly isn't what Malkonig as a manufacturer would have charged for it. And so its distribution model is definitely a challenge when it comes to competing with these other grinders. However, Malkonig as a manufacturer has an advantage that these other grinder manufacturers do not, and that is scale. Malkonig builds tens of thousands of grinders a year, possibly more. They, they are manufacturing an enormous number of these, and that brings costs down in both parts and labor costs. 
they have built uh, production around high volume and, and that makes it cheaper to make. In the case of some of these grinders, they're, they're being built by hand by passionate people who might even own the company that you're buying from. It's a very different model and that's worth bringing up. And secondly, because it's built for cafes, that has a massive impact on its workflow and its purpose. Now, in the other grinders I've talked about accessories, this comes with none. Nothing whatsoever, nothing to weigh into, nothing to grind into, not a thing. Now typically this might go to a cafe who, if they're using it for say batch brewing, they'd probably be weighing the beans out in the paper filter, pouring it in and grinding back into the paper filter for a Fetco or a bun or something like that and, and brewing that way. Or most commonly, they're gonna use it to grind a bag of coffee for a customer to take home. A lot about this part of the grinder here is, is built around grinding bags of coffee because that's kind of what a lot of people use it for, and it needs to be very good at that. At home, your requirements are very different. You're not gonna be grinding 100 grams of coffee for a Fet Cobra. You're not gonna be grinding 250 grams of coffee for a, a bag of something to, to give to a friend or family member. Realistically, you're gonna be grinding 20 grams of coffee at a time. And I don't really think this is built for that. I'm gonna seem a little bit negative about this because ultimately, it does a good thing. It grinds in a more uniform manner and it helps coffee taste better at higher extractions. That isn't really up for debate, but it's not built really to do it in the home. It's just not. And so using it at home is often a less enjoyable experience than using it in a cafe is. Now, there have been lots of cafes that have tried to adapt this to, to grind coffee for every single espresso that they pull. And you've seen people sort of create and manufacture additional items to help make that a, a more enjoyable part of the process. But those are expensive and ultimately it's still kind of a convoluted workflow. But let's talk through the grinder just very quickly. You can see at the back here, a very large motor mounted on this little stand here. The normal EK has a larger piece here, raising it up higher, making it easier to get a bigger bag underneath. People began modding these themselves, and so Malconic kind of copied that and made a shorter version. The dial on the front goes from zero round to 16, and that's your grind setting. And again, smaller the number, finer the grind. At zero, you're typically finer than you would need for espresso, and at 16, you're probably coarser than you would need for something like a, a French press or something else that you might want to brew with a, a coarse grind, maybe cold brew if that's your thing. It really does cover a full grind spectrum, and it does grind well across every setting. One small complaint from the get-go is that they built this model to be shorter, uh, and that's good, especially for the home, but what they chose to do was put on a very large hopper on the top of it. I don't really understand why they decided to put such a long, tall hopper here if they're making a shorter grinder. It really makes no sense to me. I will also say that the quality control on the hoppers generally has been a bit of a problem. I broke this hopper almost instantly upon sort of using it. It's got quite a difficult mechanism that it locks onto the top of this with. There's a little gasket inside here and it sort of clicks in. In the case of this one, uh, the glue around the edge here and on here was very poorly done. And so it came almost straight off when I tried to unlock the hopper. That's really disappointing. And, and ultimately this should be a better piece. Uh, I, I will say that replacing this with a better hopper would be high on my list if I had one of these at home. In addition, the hopper has a little sort of gate on there. Uh, some of the old ones would have a gate that swung out but remained attached, so you didn't pull it all the way out. This one you pull all the way out, and I, I don't actually like that because getting it back in again is a bit fussy. You've got your vertically mounted burr set here, a very large burr set as well. Coffee drops sort of through them and down. That's a very smart way to approach things. Now in terms of accessing the burrs on this thing, it's not particularly difficult, but it does require tools. So you're gonna open up the two screws here, you'll be able to take this front piece off and access the burrs that way. It's not a particularly painful thing, but it's not as easy as some of the other grinders in there. But once you're inside, you'll see there's some, some pretty chunky burrs in there. Now the styling on this grinder is, I would say iconic at this point, but I don't think it's it's super beautiful. If you look back at some of the grinders they used to make, like the W1BN, which was built in the 50s and 60s, that I think is super beautiful. And here, end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, a lot more boxier straight lines. Uh, I think that's kind of a shame. Now I guess what we should do is probably pull a shot of espresso and, and talk about that part of the process. Now again, I'm gonna be using a spray bottle for my doses because it does reduce the staticky mess around one of these things. Again, it doesn't come with a spray bottle. There's no recommendation to use one, but from my point of view, I certainly prefer it that way. 
Now, when you're grinding for espresso, you're obviously not going to put a portafilter underneath it here because a terrible mess would ensue and that's just that's just not recommended. I'm going to use that little dosing cup from a niche grinder because that works super well. It's a little bit surprising to me that the EK43S in particular does not come with something to grind into. The S is definitely going to be more popular with people at home rather than cafes, but you get nothing, which is kind of a shame. Now, when it comes to grinding, the motor is relatively loud, but it does grind very quickly. Now, it does have a very effective knocker, but that's really built to be a bag knocker. You can see from the shape of this piece here, this is designed for a retail bag to sit inside a retail bag, and the knocker is designed to prevent a buildup of ground coffee around the exit here, keep it moving into the bag below. It works fine to help clear it, but this whole awkward piece here really isn't designed for, for dosing some coffee for an espresso shot. Now with the style of espresso that people pull on an EK, it's typically a longer shot. It's not like a two to one, it's more like a three to one in some cases, a much larger espresso. And that's very common for unimodal style grinders. The espresso you get from it is balanced, it is sweet, it is clean, but it doesn't have a ton of texture. And that's a function of both unimodal grinders as well as those larger espresso ratios that you typically use to get good espresso from them. I enjoy this style of espresso, though I often find myself missing a little bit of texture. Now, when it comes to dialing these things in, they are fussy and finicky and quite frustrating. Retention is a little bit of an issue with this grinder, wherein um, you'd almost benefit from a little purge in between grind settings in a way that some other grinders don't really need. But with this one, I would recommend it. Otherwise, you can find yourself chasing a grind setting around and around and around. And in my experience, where a coffee might be set first thing in the morning or on one day, you might need to dial it in again the next day. It's a little bit more of a chase. Some people don't really struggle with this, but I've generally needed to redial in fairly often with this with one particular coffee. Your mileage may vary. Now, this is probably more commonly used for filter coffee than it is for espresso, and we'll be testing filter coffee extractions against the other grinders in that big showdown video at the end of this week. Obviously, it's very good at what it does. Otherwise, it wouldn't have had the impact that it had. It wouldn't have become the most popular grinder in specialty coffee shops around the world. It would have generated the hype, the interest, the research, everything that's gone along with it. This is a hugely influential grinder, and you can't really argue that it isn't good at what it does when you look at the impact that it's had on the coffee industry. And so you, you might be a little bit confused because initially it seems like I've had a bit of a rant against this thing, but now I'm saying it's great at what it does. And I feel like I'd hold those two opinions and, and not feel any cognitive dissonance. It is a great grinder for a cafe. I don't really think it belongs at home. In these videos, we haven't talked a ton about alignment, how perfectly aligned the two burrs are to make sure there's no wobbling or, or no variance in grind size as they spin. Historically, EK43s have needed some help with alignment, and, and that's frustrated a lot of people. This is an expensive grinder. Why doesn't it come out of the box perfectly aligned? And I can't speak on behalf of Malkernick here, but the number of grinders they're dealing with is so much higher than almost any other manufacturer who's obsessing about these kind of tolerances. Historically, these had kind of been all over the place sometimes. You know, that the alignment had been a problem. And with all of these reviews, I'm not touching that with these grinders. I'm reviewing them as stock because I think that's fair. As a consumer, you should review what you get. You shouldn't be reviewing the modified, tweaked, improved versions of those things. But it has been an issue with these grinders and it, it is seemingly getting better, though I do worry a little bit about the QC with them, with the volume that they're producing. And it's the little details. It's the fact that my hopper broke almost instantly. It's the fact that these stickers, which they've now changed, but mine are just peeling off already and it's less than a month old. These little details, they do bother me, and they would bother me all the more if I'd bought this to use at home, where, where I have a different kind of relationship than I would do in a cafe where I need it to be a workhorse. And it is a good, solid workhorse. And so I can't avoid talking about this grinder as part of this week's grinder reviews because it is so influential, it is so important in coffee, but it does sit out of place compared to the other grinders because it's built for a cafe and it's not built for home. I will continue to buy these for businesses. I will continue to use these almost every day. But would I recommend that you put one in your home? I don't know. You'd have to think carefully about your workflow, how you want to work, and for the price point, does it deliver the best results? I will say it produces great tasting coffee, no question. And when they're very well aligned, really delicious coffee. 
really very good. I have no complaints about the quality that these things can produce at all. But I am looking forward to pitting it head to head in both espresso and filter coffee against these other grinders. Now I don't get to keep this one. I'm going to give this one away to one of my Patreon backers because Patreon gives me a budget every month to go and buy these grinders, not be relying on freebies or loaners or that kind of stuff. I can buy them, review them, tell you my honest thoughts, and at the end I can give them away. And that makes me very happy. But now I want to hear from you down in the comments below. Tens of thousands of people around the world have these in businesses and in homes. Let me know your experience. Do your frustrations mirror my frustrations? Have you modded it, adapted it in some way? Do you like what I like? Did I miss something? I want to hear from you down in the comments below. But for now, I say thank you so much for watching. Hope you have a great day.